History is full of amazing stories and memorable people. But we don't care about them. No, it's deep tracks only. Some of the most influential people in the world have been completely overlooked or just plain forgotten. We're digging deep into the history books to bring you their stories. I'm Phil. And I'm Matt. We're not historians. We're just two guys who enjoy a great story and plenty of laughs. This is History's B-Side. Today's B-Sider is Le Corvo and her gibbet. So I wanted to start today's episode off um, by explaining, A, the reason why we're doing Le Corvo as a topic, uh, because it happens to be a, a suggestion from one of our listeners and my girlfriend, Ali Gavette. <laughs> and spoiler alert, the topic for today actually is one of her ancestors. I'm not sure whether it's a direct like grandparent or an aunt, but in her distant past, her family line can be traced to today's topic, Le Corvo. So I'm sure we have nothing but good things to say about her ancestors in this episode. Really great people. I I, I would love to say yes, but I think I'll let our listeners decide for sure. <laughs> I think there's arguments to be made both directions as far as Le Corvo is concerned. You know, there's a lot of questionable things that went on during her life, especially concerning her alleged committing of a murder. But <laughs> I also think there were some societal forces working against her, too, that we'll get into. Okay. But her her descendants are fantastic people. <laughs> her story, I mean, I, I obviously we're going to get into it, but it's, I guess, reminding me a little bit of Elizabeth Bathory that we talked about couple weeks ago or yeah months ago or whenever that was at this point <laughs> yeah it was around the time of that episode i think i might have been talking about elizabeth bathory to her and she brought le Corvo up and told me the story but i realized when i was thinking about how to start this episode that you and i have never really talked about our ancestry on here which is maybe not strange i don't know how much that comes up for <laughs> people during conversation but considering we are a history podcast I felt like maybe it was appropriate for us to start off by casually introducing our own lineages and ancestors. Do you know much about yours? Um, not a ton, I guess. So my my obviously my father's side of the family is the Halls, and my mother's side, her maiden name is Easterday. And so I have an aunt on my mother's side who actually did all this work and collected a not a scrapbook I don't think but just put together this book that tracked all kinds of lineage and mm -hmm. my family on that side specifically and she's actually like still working at it like she gave my sisters and me um, a sheet to fill out that has we can put like information on our spouses and I think their families as well so that she can kind of document mm -hmm. this for future use yeah but that side we know quite a bit as far as like names and everything because I remember looking at this old you know family tree of all the different people. And I think a lot of them came from Germany under the name like Hiltzebeck that got changed to Hilsebeck mm. and very similar, obviously. But we we had a lot of documentation of those names and that history from generations. But on my dad's side of the family, it's really not too much. I know that my great, great grandpa Patterson, I think his name was, like was a stowaway on a boat from England. <laughs> And then hmm. his daughter was my great grandmother, who I I remember from my childhood. Um, she lived into being her nineties. But other than that, like we really, as as far as I know, don't know too much about our family history. At least on my dad's side, I I know almost nothing about the halls <laughs> and where we come from. Yeah, I mean it's funny that you say it say that because. I feel like it's pretty much the same for me. Like my aunt on my mom's side did all of this work to trace the whole family all the way back to the Revolutionary War. Oh, wow. And did all the documentation for it and, you know, spent like the better part, if not more than a decade doing work to compile all this information. And I know like a little bit about my dad's side, but I just know that my great grandparents were the ones that came here from Calabria. And that was that. I was That's see, about as much as I know. Last week on our uh yeah. Aloysius Lilius episode, you talked about your family was from uh, 
Crotone in Calabria? Is that what it was? I don't remember the town name. I think that was the province. Or Chiro. Providence. Chiro, or Provence. Crotone, Calabria. Well, that's Chiro is near there, there yes. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that's really all I know about my dad's side. So we're in similar situations. Have you gotten a chance to do like 23 and Me or anything like that? I haven't. I, I think that stuff is interesting, but like it's also kind of creepy, I think, in how they use your information. Um, I found out that my sister actually did one. And mm-hmm. well, actually, Rita's sister did as well. And it was always funny because they, they always talked about how they're I don't know if they're, they claim to be a hundred percent Italian, but they're very Italian. Like her family is Italian, but her sister did one and found out that she's actually a greater percentage French than Italian. Yeah. So either they've been living a lie and they're not quite as Italian as they thought, or the running joke in her family is that that sister is adopted. So maybe she's French and the rest of the family <laughs> is Italian. <laughs> oh my God. But um, I found out that my oldest sister, Lindsay did one. It wasn't 23 and me. I'm not sure which one she did, but um, we've always thought that our family was German, English, and Irish. Like those are the big three, but none of them, like we're not super strong with any cultures or customs from any kind of ancestry. Um, and I looked at her results a bit and those are like some of the bigger ones. Like we're more just English, Northwestern Europe more than anything. Um, there were a couple yeah. other ones that were higher up that I didn't really expect like Scottish and Welsh were both above German and Irish. So the the, the stuff is kind of cool to see, but I mean, I guess my, my history is about as European white as you could possibly be. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that you said that about the Italian, because as far as I've heard, like everybody I know whose family is Italian that did 23 and me, their actual estimate was way higher than what the what their actual blood contains (laughs) i feel like we're all just stacking and rounding up (laughs) i mean i think over the centuries we're maybe a little biased because we're from youngstown ohio which is a fairly italian area and i think there's a lot of like adopted italians in our area like you just grow up around these people that have the italian food and the italian customs that we know of and you claim to be Italian, even though you're not necessarily biologically. <laughs> right. But yeah, a lot of people I knew who we used to say 100% or 75% ended up being less than half, which is why I was so pleased when I got my results, because we always said we were 75% Italian, and I only dropped seven percentage points to 68%. Oh, wow. So, so you actually it. did so, yeah, yeah, I did 23 and Me. My dad is above 95 percent italian ancestry (laughs) and my mom apparently had at least close to 50 because we came back 68 percent italian and then the other stuff we kind of knew um like we knew british and irish were part of our ancestry but the part that surprised me was like a fair amount like eight or you know eight to ten percent of french and German, and then also Portuguese and Spanish, which I didn't know huh. were. So did your sister do one too? Mm-hmm. Were your results the same? I always wondered that because you would think they'd have to be identical, but... They were pretty close. I remember them being pretty close, almost identical. I don't I don't remember if they were or not. I'll have to go back and check those. Hmm. Well, you better not murder anyone because you know they can check <laughs> that stuff. I didn't plan on it, which is why I'm okay with them having my DNA. <laughs> it's always good. You never I know only... what might happen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's true. So did you find anything interesting when you did yours? Like a guy I work with actually found, he never knew his biological father. And then through doing one of these, he found an aunt hmm. that connected him to his father. I mean, obviously, you know your parents, but like, did you find any weird relatives or anything? Not really. I don't think I found anybody I didn't already know about. I also haven't checked it in a while. They probably found like some third or fourth cousins that I've never met. But oh, okay. You know, <laughs> I mean, we did one of these for go our find dog, them. but I don't know how like similar that is for <laughs> right the the human version of DNA testing. Yeah, but no, the only surprising stuff was the Portuguese and the French hmm. that I didn't really know about. But it's, again, it's such, it's such a small percentage that you can't, it's not like, 
it's like seven percent French and German. I can't be like I'm French, ha ha. You, <laughs> you know, you can like, claim it. I'm according to my sister, two percent Norwegian, and I'm now going to claim that. <laughs> as you should <laughs> make yourself more white and Northern European. Yes, <laughs> I'm a Viking. <laughs> I am a Viking. So did your actual like lineage, the the work your aunt did, did was there any anything of note or interesting in that? Uh, I don't remember it particularly well. I think I looked at it for some kind of high school history project or something like that. There, we did have yeah. a distant relative whose middle name was Tecumseh, which I thought was interesting. Apparently, like hmm. we have some kind of connection to... I think it was a Cherokee tribe, but I have to imagine it's like such a small amount, if any, that like it wouldn't actually register on a DNA test or anything like that. So I, I'm not, yeah. I'm not going to claim that one. I'm not going to say I'm uh, who was the senator a couple years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was. I didn't know most of the people on our ancestry report that my aunt did. Obviously, most of them had already passed mm-hmm. or were you know passed before i was born but we did find out that we had ancestors that fought in the revolutionary war in fact i could have could have but didn't apply for a scholarship on that basis oh my gosh i didn't end up doing it but hey there it is it, i mean it wasn't for like thousands and thousands of dollars but still money left on the table how does that even work like do you have to prove that and Like, who's funding these scholarships that are specifically for descendants of Revolutionary War veterans? I don't know who's funding them. But yeah, you did have to provide some sort of evidence, at least as far as I remember. Hmm. Like a submission of the Ancestry report. But yeah, right? Who's funding that? (laughs) (laughs) I want to make a really random scholarship that's just like, I am... The scholarship is for anybody with their left arm removed that's shorter than five eight and also has a limp <laughs> done <laughs> I, I don't even know how to respond to that i feel like there's some kind of i don't know <laughs> i feel like there's Probably a lot there that i that. just shouldn't touch or make a joke about <laughs> you're not wrong <laughs> so how about we get into our topic <laughs> <laughs> sure <laughs> Was our oh, topic God. under five eight with a limp and missing her left arm? None of the above. I don't know how tall she was. She was probably under five eight. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Marie Joseph Corvo was born in seventeen thirty three, probably in January or February, and baptized on May fourteenth of the same year, in the rural parish of Saint Valier in New France. What is New France? Is that Canada? So, sort of. Um, it depends on what time period you're asking about, because New France changed as, you know, they colonized the Americas and then uh, gradually lost control. But at its peak, New France included most of the eastern half of Canada and also dipped all the way down to New Orleans and where Louisiana is oh, now. Oh, okay. So um, that makes a lot of sense. So... At the height, at its biggest, it basically was most of the middle United States and the eastern half of Canada, excluding the 13 colonies. So is this kind of why the Louisiana Purchase was bought from France? Yes, that's exactly. It's pretty much, yeah. I mean, it's the eastern half of Canada and what we bought in Louisiana Purchase as far as the map goes. So they had a huge swath of land considered New France at the time. Obviously, their control remained, or at least influence remained, in eastern Canada um, for a little bit longer. But during this time, it was pretty close to when the British ended up taking control. And that's just a consideration, I guess, we should have as far as, like, a consideration we should have, historically speaking, is that during this story, the the French will lose control to the British. So all of these people who are living under French rule end up living under British rule, which has a lot of implications as far as being able to speak the language and understand certain cultural normalities um, that'll come up later. But yes, essentially New France was most most, most of North America <laughs> at one point. 
I think it's, I mean, it's funny because yesterday or whenever it was that you sent me this outline for the episode, I was thinking before you sent it to me, we haven't done any Canadians yet on our podcast. I don't think, or like people that have maybe briefly traveled through Canada, but yeah, I don't know that we, like, have we haven't either. had any Canadian main talks. And I know like she's not actually Canada because it wasn't Canada at the time, but that region of the world. Yeah. Pre-Canada. <laughs> Did you know Canada wasn't actually a country until like relatively recently? I did not know this. I know it is a fairly recent like establishment of a country. I don't know when that was. And it was kind of just like a, was it an independent territory or was it still owned by some European country? Well, it was always connected to the UK. Um, I think after the 1800s or so, at some point in the 1800s or late, 1700s the british took control of most of canada from france don't they still recognize like queen elizabeth as their their queen though or is that not a thing anymore i think they just stopped but it was pretty recent Hmm. i'm not sure on that though (laughs) we we should learn more about canada i feel like that's a really bad americanism so in 1867 the British North American provinces, which were the province of Canada, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick, were united into one federation called the Dominion of Canada. But I think it was still connected to the UK until the Statute of Westminster, which basically declared independence from the United Kingdom for Canada, which was in 1931. So it was pretty recently. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I didn't realize that as recently as 1931, Canada was still part of the UK. And they're, like, not even 100 years old yet. (laughs) Yeah. So, anywho. uh, Marie-Joseph Corvo is born in St. Valier in New France, which was close to Quebec City. Um, She was the only surviving offspring of a man by the name of Joseph Corvo, who was a farmer, and Marie-Francois Bolduc. Her 10 brothers and sisters actually ended up all dying during childhood. So she was the only one to survive to adulthood. That's a lot. Rough start. (laughs) As we say on our podcast, it was the times children died. (laughs) Real sad. Terrible. At the age of 16, she was married to a local farmer named Charles Bouchard, who was 23 at the time of their marriage. Rumors that only started after the death of her second husband say that she murdered him, as there is no concrete record of his death. Legend suggests that Marie Joseph had him killed by pouring molten lead in his ear. I don't even know if that would... Would that kill you? I assume it would, but like, I feel like it also just might hurt a lot. I think anything molten poured on you is going to... On your head is going to kill you, because it's probably going to melt through your skull to your brain but also lead poisoning Yikes. <laughs> right? this got dark folks this got real dark i mean I'm you sorry. jumped right in with the murder <laughs> <laughs> i did so already we can kind of see this departure from like reality of oral tradition and storytelling where there's something that actually happened to him but then there's all these legends around it and like I mentioned, that all kind of started after the death of her second husband. So it's not get to in a moment. like real or confirmed that he had molten lead poured in his ear. Right. That That is not, I think, in like legal conditions confirmed <laughs> as a thing that happened. Do it we was know... more like legend that ended up. So you said there was no like record of his death. Is there anything that would say how he actually died? I did not find any actual record of why he died. Okay. Some articles said that it was, he died from unexplained causes. Um, It was noted that his death was sudden and a surprise, but that was the most information other than this legend. (laughs) Surprise molten lead in the ear. (laughs) Surprise. That would be a surprise. So Le Corvo's first husband, Charles, dies of something we don't know what and was buried on april 27th 1760 so they were married what is that 10 years about just short of 10 years i think i mean she was 16 
at the time of their marriage, which would have been 1749. So 11, 11 years. Okay. Interestingly enough, Corvo remarried 15 months later on July 20th, 1761, less than two years after the death of her first husband, to Louis-Etienne Dottier, another farmer from St. Vallier. Corvo and Dottier's marriage had been an ongoing topic of public gossip, and Corvo's father, Joseph Corvo, had a number of public fights with Dottier over property and business dealings. Marie had petitioned unsuccessfully to leave her husband on the grounds that he was physically abusive. Mm -hmm. And this is where some of the cultural context starts to come into play, where we have this legend about her, we have what actually happened, and we also have the the consideration of how women were treated, especially in this time where there's different countries taking over the same land. And it's, I think, fairly difficult to have a fair, what we would consider today to be a fair, you know, court under justice of law just because of the conditions that they were in at the at the time right on the morning of january 27th 1763 louis dottier was found dead in his barn with multiple head wounds these wounds were initially thought to have been the result of being kicked in the head by a horse (laughs) so (laughs) when i read this my first thought when they found him dead was like who did they believe killed him? Because they probably would not have just assumed that it was her, probably because of mm-hmm. attitudes towards women at the time that they wouldn't expect women to be the murderers, like even just capable of murdering someone. And I was like, okay, why do they think he died? And of course they blame it on the horse. <laughs> like, do you think there would have been other f- female murderers or serial killers at this time period that maybe got off because people thought that the women were just too innocent to murder? I don't know. I don't think so. I I think, I mean, and this is in the right time period that that's what a lot of the various witch trials that went on in Europe and the New World were about were situations where women had done, I mean, in, in a lot of cases, nothing at all, but women had responded violently to the conditions they were in, whether in a physically abusive marriage or another another case but i think a lot of the public fear that came around witchcraft had to do with the idea that you know women that women that stood up for themselves or were violent towards their husbands were committing some sort of sorcery (laughs) that was considered evil or by the devil instead of just he was being an asshole so i shot him (laughs) It's just, I think that's something that's really hard to understand without putting yourself in the time. Like, right. I mean, we talk today about some of the ways that women are treated differently than men, but it's still like <laughs> nothing compared to the the way that women were thought of at this time period. That it, not even just the fact that like they were viewed as property of their husbands or just like a lesser type of human, but just that women wouldn't have been capable of certain things or that if they found if someone found that they were capable of certain things, they're automatically a witch or, Mm -hmm. you know, some other ridiculous thing. Cause that's more realistic than the idea that a woman would be capable of the same things that a man is. Right. Right. So of course that her husband, her second husband also dying and him having these strange wounds And also the public knowledge of their strained relationship and Dottier's relationship with her father, the rumors about town quickly turned focus to the possibility of murder. Dottier's wounds were re-examined and determined to have been caused by something closer to a pitchfork than horse hooves, and both Joseph and Marie were accused of murdering him. I was going to say that is interesting that, you know, Joseph, the father, and both of her husbands were all farmers, right? Mm -hmm. so they i mean they obviously had business dealings and they had this this background disagreement between the father and her second husband at least like it's it's interesting that they both have motive on this like clearly yeah she's in what she's claiming to be an abusive relationship and her father already has issues with this guy so could go either way right when i think 
if there was any foul play on her and her father's part as far as lying, which there ha I mean, either way, there must have been unless neither one of them killed him. But mm -hmm. I think they kind of if that did happen, I think they seized the opportunity for this kind of ambiguous public knowledge of mm -hmm. their both of their relationships with him. Yeah. So all of these events lead up to the trial and execution of Le Corvo. But before we get to that, we're going to take a short break and we will be right back. So our listeners are pretty used to hearing us talk about what we're drinking on the on the episodes that we record. And usually it's beer, wine, or some sort of spirit. Sometimes that has to do with the B-sider of the day. But today I'm just drinking a cup of coffee. And to be honest with you, Phil, it's the single worst cup of coffee I think I've made for myself <laughs> in several years. Oh no, is it truck stop coffee? Because I've had a lot of experience <laughs> drinking truck stop coffee recently. Honestly, I don't know how I did it, but this might be worse than truck stop coffee. It doesn't have the metallic taste, <laughs> but... It's definitely, it, it's on par with uh, a terrible gas station cup of coffee. That sounds disgusting. It's delightful. Maybe you should uh, buy some coffee or someone should buy you coffee. You know what? I like that second option a little bit better. And it works out because we're here today to tell our listeners about a new listener support service we're using called Buy Me A Coffee. And you can find us and buy us a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash histories b-side. And it's cool because there's a couple different ways that our listeners can get involved and support the show. Number one, you could just donate to the show by clicking buy them a coffee. Two, you can join as a member with levels starting at $5 per month. A few of the membership perks include monthly bonus episode titled History's B-Side Battles, in which we debate to see which B-Sider would come on top in a battle royale to the death. You also get access to our future episode queue, discounts on extras on our online shop, and history's B-side gifts and swag. And those extras, like you mentioned, include things like choosing topics for future episodes. You can buy custom postcard sets or stickers. And we even have some things like coffee mugs or some future merch that we're going to add on there as we go. And you obviously don't have to be a member to get those things. But if you are a member, you get a discount on them. And it's actually a much better deal 25 to 50% off what you would if you weren't a member. It's a great way for our listeners to support us in a more casual way and make sure that we're not recording while drinking terrible cups of coffee like the one I have in my hand right now. <laughs> the website again is buymeacoffee.com slash histories b-side. We so appreciate your support. It's what helps us continue to put these episodes on every single week and continue our research and make sure you're learning about all the cool people from history that we sometimes forget. With that said, let's get back to today's B-Sider. All right, welcome back. So we left off with, you know, some of the beginning of LaCorivo's life, as well as the lead up to her trial for the murder of her husband. Um, and when we left off... We weren't sure whether it was Marie or her father, Joseph, that had actually killed Dottier. Murder, intrigue, mystery. So at the time, New France had been conquered by the British in 1760 as part of the Seven Years' War and was under the administration of the British Army. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, the a region that had been primarily French dominated had quickly been taken over by the British. But there were still citizens living there that were used to the French language and the French culture. And that becomes partially important later when we consider the fairness of Marie's trial. But on hearing the rumors that either her or her father had killed Dottier, the local British military authorities, who were charged with keeping order, set up an inquiry into Dottier's death. The inquiry opened in Quebec City on March 29th, 1763. At the Ursulines of Quebec, charging Joseph Corvo and his daughter Marie Joseph before a military tribunal made up of 12 English officers and presided over by Lieutenant Colonel Roger Morris. Many persons in the community had testified, including Joseph's niece and Marie Joseph's cousin, a young woman approximately the same age as Marie, named Isabel Sylvain. So those are two different girls, his niece who testified and 
Isabel Sylvain who is being no. charged? Am I no? Those that? are the same. So th- there's three people being charged: Joseph, Marie, and then Isabel Sylvain, who is Joseph's niece and Marie's cousin. Oh, okay, okay. So three people being charged: Joseph, Marie, and Isabel. What was believed that she had to do with the murder? She was ended up being charged for perjury because during the trial when she was being inter I don't know I don't know if the right word is interrogated. When she was being questioned during the trial, she had, you know, different stories and changed her story once or twice and things just didn't line up, so she was charged with perjury. So was she involved like was she there when the murder took place? Is it believed? I don't think she was there when the murder took place. I think it might be safe to say that she had some involvement in trying to hide it with okay joseph and marie but that's speculation based on the fact that they found her guilty of perjury okay. and she was lying during the trial um but given that this was well over 200 years ago i don't know how <laughs> <laughs> how valid that assumption is fair so the trial ended on the 9th of april with joseph corvo being sentenced to death for culpable homicide of his son-in-law Marie was found to be an accomplice to murder and sentenced to 60 lashes and branded with the letter M on her hand. Isabel Sylvain, who Joseph also employed as a servant, had testified but changed her story several times during the hearing. She was found guilty of perjury and given 30 lashes and branded with the letter P. How much has criminal punishment changed over the years? We don't brand people don't anymore. Mean, they used to be really into branding. <laughs> I mean, Just marked for life. <laughs> I guess we could file that under cruel and unusual, cruel and unusual punishment today. Oh my god! So like that's definitely probably why we don't do it. But I don't know. Is that effective? I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure it would be cruel and unusual punishment at this point. I'm not arguing in favor of it, but like <laughs> we've gotten soft on our criminals. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I feel like that's that makes a whole me other sound conversation. Bad. <laughs> that was intended as a joke and not a, a conversation about capital punishment. <laughs> Back to the 1760s, I think. <laughs> so they end up finding Joseph to be the main committer. Committer? Is that a word? The main person to have committed the murder. <laughs> committer. So they find him guilty, and the night before he was to have been hanged, he received confession. And during the confession, he admitted that he had not been the killer and was no more than an accomplice to his daughter after she had killed Dottier. What a snitch on his own daughter. I mean, I don't know what it's like to know that I'm going to die tomorrow, but like, I feel like why go to the trouble of lying at all if you're just going to flip, right? Like, just... He could have just threw her under the bus to begin with. Well, so the way I'm interpreting this, I guess, is that they always assume that he was the killer because like we talked about earlier, they probably just wouldn't have thought that a woman would have killed him. So it had to be the father. So no matter what he said in court, like there wasn't anyone else that they would have charged with it besides him. But I think, when did he say this? This was during like his last rights confessional? He yeah, this was after his him. sentencing the night before he was to be hanged during confession, said it wasn't him and that he had just taken the fall for his daughter who had actually killed Dottier. I think that just goes to show the importance or how serious they took these religious practices of confessions that that, like him saying that during his last rites was of greater weight than anything that took place in the trial. (laughs) That they were like, oh, he said this to a priest, so he definitely wasn't lying. It wasn't him. (laughs) Right. And I mean, maybe that's a comment on like how serious it was for him too, that he, his con- if he thought he was going to die tomorrow, like his conscience had to be clean that it, it wasn't him that committed the murder. It was his daughter or he just threw right. her under the bus because maybe he doesn't have a spot. He didn't want to die. <laughs> Either way, at a second trial on April 15th, Marie testified to having killed her husband with two blows of a hatchet during his sleep because of his ill treatment of her. The tribunal so found her guilt. Yeah, she basically admitted to killing him. Okay. Um, 
So that is, I mean, the one thing I suppose we know is that she did. <laughs> so I guess Joseph is still story. a snitch, but at least he was not lying to throw her under the bus. <laughs> right. So the tribunal found her guilty and sentenced her to hang. Her body after to be hanged in chains, that is, put up for public display, on a gibbet. What is a gibbet, you might ask? (laughs) I was going to ask that, but I had a feeling you were about to explain it. So a gibbet is basically a... It sometimes can just be a very small cage, but in a lot of iterations, it is a human body-shaped cage that either a living soon to be dead or dead person might be hung in for the purpose of public humiliation. Because in the case of a hanging, sometimes it wasn't enough to just hang the person and kill them. It needed to be taken further by hanging their body in a public square for several days to weeks after the hanging for the public to see. This might be like a little hint for you, but I looked up gibbets while I was preparing quiz questions for you. Oh, God. And it is pretty gross. <laughs> like, just the concept of it is pretty gross. Yeah. You can, I mean, you can look at it and just it's imagine not great. how they were used and how they worked. Yeah. <laughs> pretty simple concept. In a much closer relationship with death, apparently. <laughs> There's hanging bodies in the public square. Yeah. It's, you know, part of your everyday life. Yeah. It's important to note that it was the British authorities' decision to not bury her, but rather put her body in a human-shaped iron cage, or gibbet. The locals pitied Marie Joseph. She and the cage were placed at the intersection of commonly used roads, presumably as a macabre warning. (laughs) This is pretty gross, though. Like, I feel like you're punishing the townspeople more than the murderer at this point. I mean, it kind of does feel that way. I, I mean, I don't think it's a good idea, but I understand thinking that that might deter people from crime but I, be, I feel like if you know the punishment is death then hanging the bodies after isn't like once you're dead you're dead and i get that there's like yeah. a shame aspect to it but like if you kill me i'm not going to know anything that you do do to my body after you kill me so i don't know i feel like as a townsperson if i know that if i murder someone i'm going to be killed it really doesn't matter to me that you display my body after does that make like do you feel the same way as me or do you think that this actually would kind of i mean i murder? wouldn't I wouldn't want to know that my body was just going to be hung in a public square to rot in front of p- people like that. That would add a tiny bit more weight to the punishment, but not a lot. If the overall punishment is death, like humiliation after death is it feels kind of like a drop in the bucket. <laughs> Do you know why did the locals pity Marie Joseph? Is it because of this shame and humiliation display Or was it they felt that she was unjustly accused or something? Well, I think the the gibbet punishment was more commonly used by the British than the French. And because the reason I said it was important to consider earlier that the British had just taken control over this primarily French cultured region, that not only were the locals probably a little bit resentful of their new authority figures, given the cultural difference, but they had this new justice policy that included a lot more gibbeting (laughs) for some reason and so i think that was a main reason is that marie was a local they were locals marie was from a french background they were from a french background and the british were coming in with this new punishment and humiliating her in the public square so the public kind of got behind her so even though she was a murderer they felt maybe a little more connected to her than they did the people who were issuing the punishment Yeah. And so while the treatment of her remains so callously disgusted the local population, as a convicted murderer, she still couldn't be buried in a cemetery. So under British rule, she kind of had to sit in this cage. However, according to legend, and much to the frustration of the British, the cage disappeared. Le Corvo had become mobile, cage and all. (laughs) Dead Le Corvo became mobile. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> as early as 1866, author Philippe Albert de Gasp wrote down the folktale that arose to explain this odd disappearance and included a key element. He wrote, A lone night traveler, Francois Dubé, hears an unusual tick-tock, 
which readers recognize as the sound of the wind blowing through the cage and the bones of Le Corvaux. As night falls, Dubé takes pity on Le Corvaux's soul and recites a De Profundis, prayer for the deceased soul. Especially important since La Corvaux had never received last rites from the church. Soon afterward, in the pitch black, Dubé cannot see that La Corvaux has reached through her cage and is climbing on his back. La Corvaux wants Dubé to piggyback her across the St. Lawrence River to Isle d'Orleans, where her fellow witches and will of the wisps are celebrating their Sabbath. Because the river is blessed, La Corvaux needs the help of Dubé, a good Christian. Dubé faints, and when he awakens the next morning, he assumes his terrifying experience was a dream, until he sees an empty liquor bottle. He naturally concludes that Le Corvaux drank its contents. Others might deduce something more obvious. <laughs> I'm surprised that this dream that he had was driven mm-hmm. by alcohol and not <laughs> something else mind-bending. Like LSD? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, something like that. I don't know. I mean, I, I could see it being driven by alcohol, but I feel like imagining a skeleton rotting corpse to climb on your back through a cage and demand that you help her as a good Christian probably is driven by more than just a bottle of liquor. Maybe it was absinthe. I've never had absinthe. You've never had absinthe? Really? It's not, I mean, it's more of a joke than the actual reality of it. It's just a really strong spirit. Oh. It doesn't actually do anything to you. It used to be made with a type of root that I think might have had some psychedelic properties, but the I've had it several times. It's just, it's like really strong vodka. Well, have you ever that had tastes a, like a running corpse climb on your back <laughs> demand that you take her to meet Jesus? I mean... Only on a handful of occasions, but (laughs) other more likely accounts simply state that her body and cage were removed and buried after local residents complained about the macabre display. Yeah, like I said, I can't really blame them for that because I think you're punishing the townspeople with this display more than you are Le Corvo. Right. Yeah, I mean, depending on your views of the afterlife, I guess. You know, she's gone. She's not here to experience hanging in the public square. It's really the public that has to deal with it. Right. Despite the mystery surrounding her disappearance, her cage would begin a new journey nearly a century later in 1851, when it was dug up from the cemetery of the Church of St. Joseph de la Pointe Levy. Soon after, the cage was stolen from the church cellar and acquired by the American impresario P.T. Barnum and put on display as a macabre object. First of all, I want to have the title American Empresario. Start a circus, I guess. <laughs> I was going to say, does that mean that she became a part of the circus? Uh, yeah, I think she was like a side display That's as awful. part of his circus. I mean, not her at this point. I mean, she's her body would have been well over 100 years old at this point. Um, yeah, but the, the it was the cage, cage that she was in. The gibbet. The gibbet. After being displayed by P.T. Barnum, it was put on display at the Boston Museum. The museum slip indicated its provenance with two words, quote, from Quebec, end quote. What does that mean? Just a cage from Quebec. I don't, I think this is just the explanation of where it's from, but it's interesting that given how much depth the story has that the cage was displayed, you know, just with the words from Quebec. (laughs) Through the efforts of the Société d'Histoire de la Vie, the cage was acquired from the Boston Museum and is now part of a permanent display at Musée de la Civilisation in Quebec City. The repercussions in the trial, the rumor that her father would be convicted of murdering Dadier at his daughter's instigation, and the gossip which grew up around the circumstances of the death of her first husband all stirred up the popular imagination and became legends still told today in the oral tradition, increasing the number of murdered husbands to as many as seven and likening Le Corvo to a witch. Do we know what happened to her father after all this? Like, was he released without any kind of punishment? I believe he was released without further punishment. I did not find anything else about 
later trials or any further good for him discipline on his part <laughs> an accomplice to murder but he got out i mean he had to deal with the fact that his daughter was hunting a cage over the public square but because he ratted her out it could have been he him did rat her out. it could have it could have the 1851 discovery of the iron cage buried in the cemetery of St. Joseph Parish served to reawaken the legends and the fantastic stories, which were amplified and used by 19th century writers. The first, in 1863, Philippe Albert de Gasp in Les Anciens Canadiens has a supernatural corvo hanging in the Point Levy cage, terrorizing one night a passer by conducting a witch's Sabbath and Will o' the Wisp at the Isle d'Orleans. James McPherson Lemoyne, who wrote Maple Leaves in 1863, and William Kirby, following in his footsteps with The Golden Dog of 1877, made her a professional poisoner, a direct descendant of La Vaison, famous for her purported role in The Affair of Poisons. Writers and historians such as Louis Friquet and Pierre-Georges Waugh have tried to give Corvo's history, but without completely separating the facts from the fantasies added in legend and novels. The story of Le Corvo is one of the few Quebecois folktales whose origins cannot be traced to similar centuries-old ones in France, according to De Caire is à Quebec by Fernand Grenier, a study of legends in both France and New France. So she's a true Canadian hero. She's one of the first people from their actual history <laughs> yeah i mean as far as their oral folktale tradition she was one of the first actual people to be transferred into this kind of oral storytelling tradition i guess it was actually canadian from history but quebec <laughs> right but but one of the first to have lived and been born lived and die on canadian soil present day canadian soil right that region in fact, now any strange noise heard at night would be attributed to the wind blowing through the cage and skeleton of Le Corvo in Quebec. The legend, now over 250 years old, still causes emotion in Quebec. It is generally agreed that Le Corvo was a victim of spousal abuse and could not have received a fair trial, as it would have been conducted solely in English. And like I said, it took place just four years after New France fell to the English, so her trial was performed in a language which she probably didn't speak very well i didn't think about that so she probably spoke exclusively french or some mm -hmm. variation of french would her husband have spoke english well her husband was dead he wasn't at the trial that was a dumb question <laughs> who would have spoken english at this trial the the judge the lawyers the jury possibly because i, I don't know exactly who the jury was made up made up of but the other way that I took that was, even if the trial was in her language, would she even have been able to defend herself because of just how women were treated? At this well, time? right. Like, that's she the other wouldn't part have been on equal standing. Like, if she is a victim of spousal abuse, she probably did not have an option to get out of that marriage. So right. I'm not like, I don't think I'd ever be on here justifying murder on our podcast, but that could have been the only way that she saw out of this marriage that she was in that was abusive. And right. it's kind of like, I'm not saying that anyone should murder anything, but that was kind of the only way out for her. If that was true. Right. And that's, I mean, that's why she is a symbol of, or a symbol for the idea of, you know, older world, sexism and the way women were treated in the new world at this time um, she's kind of a i don't want to say heroine but she is a symbol of what women went through legally at least um and you know existentially too where they're living with spouses that don't treat them well but because of the standards of society they're stuck in that situation without any real way out you know we mentioned that she tried to file for separation from her husband and was not granted that so i'm again i like i don't think it justifies murder necessarily but if you don't give somebody any way out legally eventually they're going to find a way out right. otherwise yeah i i mean that is super interesting i it's it's different than when we talked about elizabeth bathory like the last female 
killer on our podcast because Mm -hmm. Bathory was a political case and she might not have murdered anyone, whereas the Corvo admitted to the murder. But the reasons behind it aren't really what you think. Like, yes, right. she probably did kill her husband because she said she did. But like, it it's a really interesting angle to take, both to defend the murder, but also to say that she should have just stayed in this abusive relationship that she had no way out of. Right. Yeah. I still blame her dad. I think he's the bad guy here. <laughs> Joseph Joseph Corvo is the one. Even though he did nothing wrong. Like if he was an accomplice and like saw that as an opportunity to get his daughter out of an abusive marriage, like he ended up having his daughter killed as a result too. Like, come on, man. Yeah. <laughs> if you enjoyed today's episode, in fact, you're in luck because movies and plays have been written about her as well as dozens of books. And if you happen to find yourself in Quebec, every so often her cage reappears as a temporary exhibit in the city, only to disappear again. Spooky. No, that's just when they're cleaning the museum. Yeah. (laughs) Put her in the vault. Put her cage in the vault. Her gibbet. What a weird, weird story. (laughs) It is a strange story. I'm interested to see what you have as far as quiz questions. Yeah, I don't. I actually do have one about Corvo, but it was a difficult one because it's just yeah. like she's she's pretty minor as far as what we know about her because it's really just this one case trial thing. But yeah, it, it was cool that there were some big implications about her story that you know surface level you don't really think about. So you ready? Ready to dive in? I think so. All right. We'll see. We'll be right back. All right. Welcome back. We like to end every episode with just a short three question quiz to Test today's host, see how much he studied in and around his topic, and maybe the listener is familiar with the story. I'm assuming that we have a couple listeners at least that are slightly familiar with Le Corvo, so maybe you can play along and see if you get these questions right yourself. How confident are you feeling, Matt? Not super confident, but I, I, I'm excited to hear your questions. <laughs> <laughs> I I think this actually isn't a terribly difficult quiz, surprisingly, because I didn't really know what to ask you about, but Mm -hmm. I found some questions that are at least sort of connected to the story, and I tried to make them not overly difficult. So for your first question, I I was unfamiliar with what New France was, and after looking it up and you explaining it a bit, I understand (laughs) what New France was. I guess I just didn't know what the name for that area was but my first question is around that and it's really what industry drove the economy of new france that became its staple good and helped the region to flourish and if you need a hint i can give you a hint i would assume fur trapping drawing back to our episode about yep (laughs) is it okay i was gonna say going back to our uh at length mountain man (laughs) yeah on our jim bridger episode but yeah the fur tried Fur trade was huge for New France and eventually that region when it became part of the United States. All right. One for one. (laughs) Question number two is more biographical about Marie Joseph Corvo. And it's just, how many children did she have? I don't know if she had any children with the second guy. I was Uh... worried you would mention this, so I'm glad you didn't. (laughs) I think I'll, I'll she, give you the. I think she that, had three. Yeah, I did not find any children with the second husband. So I think I think she had three. That is correct. She had three children yes. with her first husband, two daughters, Marie Francois and Marie Angelique, and her son was named Charles. I you like think I would have mentioned that there. since the beginning of our episode was about ancestry? <laughs> you think I would have? <laughs> finished explaining her her lineage number three 
And this is where I researched gibbeting. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> it's not anything gross. Can you name the five types of criminals for whom gibbeting was often used as a punishment? By the British? I would assume. I mean, it was five specific types of cr- criminals or crimes that most commonly would have been would have received a gibbet, I guess. I don't know what the correct verbiage on that is. But it, it was applied to other crimes as well. These were just the five most yeah. common. My guess would be murder. Yep. Theft or robbery. Sort of highwaymen, which is like robbery okay. of travelers. Like, yeah. Yeah, so I'll give you that. I would guess treason would probably be one. Traitors, yep. I don't know if piracy is different than theft. Piracy is number four. Okay. So I got four out of five. Shoot. Yeah, you're doing great on this uh, quiz. I don't know. Assault? No, this is the hard one. Tax evasion? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sheep stealers. <laughs> Which I feel is different than theft because it's specifically sheep. Sheep only. So there's a whole separate classic criminal that were sheep. Yeah. Thieves. They, it's lawyers who practice sheep law. Sheep law. That's t- today's version of white collar crime. Sheep stealers. <laughs> I mean, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> when the main industry was agriculture, sheep stealers were the old school white collar criminals. <laughs> the worst of the worst. Give him the gibbet. <laughs> Do you think we need to discuss whether or not Lakorovo was a good person? I mean, I think it is a little ambiguous. Like, if she actually killed her husband, which it appears that she did, like, that's not stellar. I don't feel like that's <laughs> no, it's usually not like great. the right way to go about things. But we also talked about the conditions under which she and other women lived in at the time. So I don't, I mean, I think there probably are some arguments to be made for her still having some moral integrity, but I don't know. Yeah. um, I kind of feel the same way. Like, I don't know that we have like a clear answer on that. I'm not saying that she is a good person, I guess, but there, I think you could make a case for justification of that situation because clearly if he was abusive, her husband wasn't a great person either. Yeah, I mean, if if there's a tr- any truth to the rumor that she murdered her first husband, maybe we uh, need to reevaluate this more. But like you said, that was more speculation than any actual fact. To quote a line from the musical Chicago, "He had it coming." <laughs> You're welcome for that. <laughs> We're rounding out the episode with a musical reference. I don't even have, I don't know what to say. <laughs> All right. Well, as always, we really appreciate you all listening and tuning in each week. If you have any questions, comments, or just want to reach out and say, hey, please hit us up at historiesbside at gmail.com or reach out to us on social media. People are just concerned that we keep talking about murderers. <laughs> We're becoming a true crime I mean, podcast. Maybe, yeah, maybe that's, maybe that's the thing. People just get, podcast people just get sucked into talking about murderers. <laughs> It's compelling. No matter stuff. what your podcast is, you're eventually going to talk about murderers. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank, thanks for listening, guys. We'll, we'll be back next week. History's B Side is an independent, listener supported podcast. Leave us a review or subscribe to the show on your favorite podcasting service and follow along on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at History's B Side. Send us your feedback or inquire about sponsorship and advertising opportunities by emailing us at historiesbside at gmail.com. You can donate to the show at buymeacoffee.com slash historiesbside. While you're there, check out our membership perks, merchandise, and more. This episode was researched and produced by your hosts, Matt Melito and Phil Hall. Thanks for listening to History's B-Side.